Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Unless you have no interest in spaceflight or have just been living in North Korea for the last several days, you should know that Astrobotic has been running into some very serious problems after a successful launch of the Vulcan Centaur. What you may not be aware of, though, is all of the incredible accomplishments that have been made with Peregrine, even though it hasn't gotten anywhere near the moon yet. And in spite of all of the odds against them, the Astrobotic staff have managed to keep this thing alive far longer than anybody anticipated, and a rendezvous with the moon no longer seems completely impossible. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again welcome to this special bulletin on the Angry Astronaut. Was not actually planning on releasing anything today, but Astrobotic has been surprising everyone. And at this point, I think it's only appropriate that we really cover just what has been accomplished thus far. As most of us know, even though the Vulcan Centaur launch went extremely well, and Vulcan delivered its payload into exactly the right trajectory in order to get it to its lunar destination, well, everything went south after that. The Peregrine developed a flaw with its propulsion system, a fuel leak of some kind, which was preventing it from aligning properly towards the sun. And without its solar panels pointing at the sun, its battery was rapidly running out of power. And in order to get it aligned properly with the sun, they had to really overtax the RCS thrusters or maneuvering thrusters on the Peregrine in order to execute a stopgap maneuver to at least get the panels pointed at the sun before the probe went into a communications blackout. But frankly, many people, including myself, were believing that Peregrine might not come out of that communications blackout because there was no guarantee that Peregrine was going to continue pointing its solar panels at the sun and the RCS thrusters were being worked over time. It really seemed like the probe had hours left at best, assuming that contact could be restored with it at all. And, of course, criticism began to avalanche as well. Criticism about the idea of using private companies to facilitate our return to the moon. Comparisons being made with the Voyager spacecraft, which, of course, had been in operation for over four decades now, whereas Peregrine looked like that it was going to fail after less than four days. However, this is not a fair comparison. I think for one big reason, which we're going to talk about a little bit coming up, but also we need to keep in mind that Peregrine has absolutely exceeded everyone's expectations after this mishap took place. Indeed, after this fuel leak transpired, everybody thought that the probe was going to die in a couple of days at most. And yet, as of the time of this recording, Peregrine is continuing to operate, and a rendezvous with the moon is now no longer outside the realm of possibility. For those of us who remember these animations from NASA regarding Voyager's visit to Saturn way back in the early 1980s, well, this seems very much like ancient history to us, and it seems impossible to think that Voyager might still be operational in the middle of deep space after all this time. But indeed, it is. And these are the sorts of things that make people think that maybe NASA is more qualified to do these kinds of missions to the planets or to the moon for that matter and private companies just really aren't up to the task but there's an important difference between the Voyager series and Peregrine and many private spacecraft the difference is nuclear power Voyager spacecraft make use of the heat generated by deteriorating radioactive isotopes, 
plutonium isotopes to be precise in order to get their electric power. Plutonium isotopes are a little difficult to get your hands on if you're not the US government. So solar power is a less expensive and still pretty reliable way of powering your spacecraft if you're a private company performing a task for NASA. However, the problem is you have to make sure that your solar panels are aligned properly with the sun or you're going to run out of power very, very quickly, which unfortunately is what happened to Peregrine shortly after being deployed from the Centaur upper stage of ULA's new rocket. So most of us know these details, but here's what happened after the problems were reported. First of all, let's talk about update number six, which by the way, took place on January 8th. Quote, an ongoing propellant leak is causing the spacecraft's attitude control system thrusters to operate well beyond their expected service life cycles to keep the lander from an uncontrollable tumble. If the thrusters can continue to operate, we believe the spacecraft could continue continue in a stable sun pointing state for approximately 40 more hours. Keep in mind this was four days ago based on current fuel consumption. At this time the goal is to get Peregrine as close to lunar distance as we can before it loses the ability to maintain its sun pointing position and subsequently loses power. Well, they accomplished that objective, Peregrine actually got out to lunar orbit. Of course, the moon wasn't in that particular position by the time Peregrine actually got there. None of this, of course, is going according to plan, but still, Peregrine continued to function beyond what anybody thought was possible. On January 9th, the Peregrine spacecraft had been operational for about 32 hours, but the team faced another spacecraft pointing issue and continued to persevere. The spacecraft apparently started to tilt away from the sun, and this reduced its solar power generation. However, they were able to update the control algorithm on the fly and fix this issue, and the batteries were once again at full charge on January 9th. Given the propellant leak, according to Astrobotic, there is unfortunately no chance of a soft landing on the moon. However, we do still have enough propellant to continue to operate the vehicle as a spacecraft. The team has updated its estimates, and we currently expect to run out of propellant in about 40 hours from now. So once again, less than two days is what they were thinking that they were going to be able to keep it operating for, and this was back on January 9th. And also on January 9th, Astrobotic began to track down the cause of the problem. Quote, Astrobotic's current hypothesis about the Peregrine spacecraft's propulsion anomaly is that a valve between the helium pressurant and the oxidizer failed to reseal after activation during initialization. This led to a rush of high-pressure helium that spiked the pressure in the oxidizer tank beyond its operating limit and subsequently ruptured the tank. While this is a working theory, a full analysis report will be produced by a formal review board made up of industry experts after the mission is complete. ULA's Vulcan rocket inserted Peregrine into the planned translunar trajectory without issue. There is no indication that the propulsion anomaly occurred as a result of the launch. Props to Astrobotic for making that particular issue very clear. In spite of the fact that there have been problems with Peregrine, there were no problems with Vulcan. Now, later on, on January 9th, they received another image from Peregrine. Apparently, they couldn't really identify what they were seeing in the image. For example, maybe it was the Earth, maybe it was a lens flare, and the camera that took the issue was located on the bottom of one of Peregrine's payload decks. Just left of center in this image is the DHL Moonbox payload covered in MLI, which contains hundreds of thousands of messages from the people of Earth. And then visible to the right of the Moonbox and near the bottom center of this photo is Astroscale's Pocari Sweat Lunar Dreamtime capsule. This was the first payload 
under contract with Astrobotic and contains messages from children around the world. And then on the bottom center right of the image, you've got the Peregrine's landing legs, one of the legs anyway, obscured by the electrical interface where they were connected with the launch vehicle. So at least we were getting some images back from Peregrine and it was still in operation. And on the 10th, things continued to improve. Peregrine had been operational in space for 55 hours at that point, and at a distance of 192,000 miles from Earth, 80% of the way to lunar orbit. Although it was approaching lunar distance, the moon wasn't going to be there, but they remained on their nominal trajectory for the mission, which includes a phasing loop around the Earth, which Peregrine is executing right now. The loop goes out to lunar distance, swings back around the Earth, and then cruises out to meet the moon. This trajectory reaches the moon in about 15 days post-launch. Of course, Peregrine is not going to last that long. Or is it? Well, Peregrine at the time was continuing to leak propellant but remained operationally stable and continued to gather valuable data. They estimated that it would run out of propellant in about 35 hours, which it didn't, an improvement on their previous update. And they, of course, continued to work around the clock to extend the spacecraft's life, and boy, were they successful. And amazingly, on January 11th, Peregrine went to work on some scientific tasks. It established communication with at least 10 different instruments. The IRIS Lunar Rover, the Colmena from the Agencia Especial Mexicana, and this, by the way, became the first Mexican payload to reach deep space. And then after that, the M42 radiation detector from the German Aerospace Center went online. Keep in mind, the these sorts of instruments can still do scientific work by detecting radiation levels in interplanetary space and in cislunar space, which is still very relevant to Artemis's overall mission. The Linear Agent Energy Transfer Spectrometer, the Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer System, the Neutron Spectrometer System, all of these went online together with the Peregrine Ion Trap Mass Spectrometer and the Nav navigation Doppler LiDAR system from NASA's Langley Research Center. On top of that, you also have the Peregrine Ion Trap Mass Spectrometer, the Pokari Sweats Lunar Dream Time Capsule from Astroscale, and finally, the Optical Precision Autonomous Landing System from Astrobotic. Now, as far as these navigation LiDAR systems and landing systems are concerned, well, they may not see any sort of practical use, but then again, I'm not putting it past Astrobotic's capabilities of at least reaching the moon and trying to set down. They will certainly fail, but they might be able to at least attempt a landing, or at the very least, crash into the moon. Two days ago, Astrobotic estimated that the spacecraft had about 48 hours of propellant remaining, again, a significant improvement from what they were looking at prior to that, and obviously, since the spacecraft is still operating, they got more than 48 hours into it, and it continues to improve because the rate of the leak is slowing more than anticipated. As the pressure drops, there's probably going to be an even further slowing of the leak rate, but there also may be some change in the size of the propulsion system's rupture as the pressure decreases or some other factor making it difficult to predict. By the 11th, Peregrine had been operating for three and a half days and was 225,000 miles from Earth, 94% of the way out to lunar orbit. And that was two days ago. And 11 hours ago, we got the most recent update from Astrobotic, and Peregrine is continuing to perform so much better than anyone anticipated four days ago. It's still operational. It's now 238,000 miles from Earth. In other words, it has now reached lunar orbit, and of course, the moon isn't there, so there's nothing to rendezvous with. However, the current trajectory that Peregrine is on may allow it to reach the moon 15 days after launch. In other words, about 10 days from now. Now, of course, their propellant estimates show that they're going to run out of fuel before they reach that 15-day mark. But at this point, I think anything is possible. 
So here's what's about to happen. On Thursday, January 18th, in other words, five days from now, at noon Eastern Time, Astrobotic is hosting a teleconference with NASA for major mission updates, and this will be streamed out on select NASA channels. Also, some journalists will be invited. I was one of the journalists to be invited to this teleconference, and I am so honored to have received this invitation. With Peregrine operating in a stable configuration and a teleconference imminent, they are going to be posting another update very soon, but they will be slowing down their update cadence for now because it appears that Peregrine may remain operational until January 18th. And a rendezvous with the moon, in my opinion, is not outside the realm of possibility. I think all of us need to give props to Astrobotic for what they've been able to accomplish given the grievous damage that Peregrine suffered and who knows what they may be able to accomplish in the near future. And other companies who are planning to go to the moon, they could learn a lot about what to do in a crisis situation from this little company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon and then you will get early access to videos like this, like my Discord supporters did earlier today. And until Peregrine makes it to the moon one way or another, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.